Good morning, friends. <clears throat> You're all trying to figure out what that story has to do with the Gospel of Mark, aren't you? <laughs> what in the world is he up to today? You're thinking, <clears throat> well, that's, that's reasonable. But the story that we just heard read is uh, kind of a, an illustration of the issue that Jesus was dealing with in Mark chapter 12. And I think you'll see this as we move through the text. But by way of introduction, I want to kind of draw your minds into the place I think this text takes us. Um, by saying this, hypocrisy is a blight on the human race. Hypocrisy is a blight on the human race. We all struggle with it to one degree or another. It is birthed in um, pride, but grows in the fertile soil of the fear of man. Because we want to impress each other and gain each other's approval, we're very susceptible to hypocrisy. We want others to think of us in the best possible light, so we dabble in hypocrisy, saying or doing things that may leave a good impression but really aren't an accurate reflection of the truth. And we all know what I'm talking about, don't we? It's like giving the impression through silence or misleading comments that you have a daily private worship time, or remaining silent when others are mentioning their personal struggle with envy, with gossip, with coveting or greed or what have you so that you give the impression that you don't have those kind of struggles. Or taking credit for something that you didn't do or at least didn't do alone. You had help, but never acknowledged that. Hypocrisy is used to fill our gaping need for significance. In our story today from Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, we're going to see hypocrisy on blatant display and hopefully learn some things about ourselves and about God. So I hope you'll pay particular attention this morning, because I think this is, whether you admit it or not, uh, something that we all face, we all struggle with. Behind the, the lessons of hypocrisy, of course, is the greater picture of what is happening in the life of Jesus Christ at this particular time of the story. As important and powerful as the lesson of hypocrisy is from this text, we cannot forget the context. Jesus here in Mark 12 is in the last week of his earthly life. Passion week, which was the Passover week, was in full swing. Uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem has taken place where Jesus was given that royal welcome by hundreds of thousands of people, which ticked off the, the Jewish leadership, of course. He had already gone into the temple the next day to clean house and turn the place upside down, literally. Um, he had just finished the parable of bad tenants who abused uh, and even murdered the servants and even the son of the vineyard owner. And so immediately after that, maybe after lunch, we could say, uh, he spoke to them about this question. The parable of the vineyard owner and the killing of his servants and ultimately his son infuriated the religious leaders because they knew he was speaking about them, says this in verse 12 of chapter 12. So this was Wednesday afternoon, and because of their fury, which had come to a, a climax here on this day, uh, Jesus was murdered 36 hours later. That's the context and what's happening here that Mark is revealing to us. But in the middle of this context is this amazing lesson on hypocrisy. This context... Uh, we're going to see a remarkable story about one of the toughest questions that Jesus ever faced and one of the most penetrating and memorable answers which left his hearers amazed and even stunned by its brilliance. So if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to turn with me to Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, and listen as I read. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk, and they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? 
But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. So, let's unpack this text together. Let's, let's dive in and see what the Holy Spirit has for you and for me today. The first thing I think you'll see is hypocrisy on display. The, the smarmy, syrupy questions and comments that they gave to Jesus before they actually cornered him. Jesus' enemies thought that they had caught him in an inescapable dilemma. Now, they had thought about this for quite some time and came to this juicy solution to upend Jesus and the public's opinion of him. But Jesus' divine wisdom brought to his mind the most powerful and profound answer that could be imagined. Let's look at it. So we see, first of all, hypocrisy is on display by making unusual alliances. And now again, I try to remind you of this as often as I can. This text was written for you and for me. It's not just an ancient history of what took place on this day in Jesus' life. It's, it's written for your benefit and for mine. So I want you to listen uh, for that. Hypocrisy makes unnatural alliances. Notice that it said the Herodians and the Pharisees got together and sent a delegation to Jesus to ask him these questions. The Herodians were the liberal wing of the Jewish leadership council. The Pharisees were generally the very conservative leaders of the Jewish leadership group. Pharisees and Herodians hated each other and were sworn enemies. But here we see, we see them joining forces to attack common, uh, common enemy. They knew that Jesus was a threat to both of them, so they, they gave up their animosity towards each other, each other so they could attack Jesus. Their question was designed to trap Jesus, of course, no matter what his answer. If Jesus would have said, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, he would have been condoning the practice of literally paying tribute to, which is how King James Version translates that word render, paying tribute to or bowing and burning incense to Caesar. In effect, worshiping Caesar. That's what they were asking him. So as we work our way through this text, I want to, at every point, ask you to consider your own struggle with hypocrisy. Here we see that it begins with making unnatural alliances. What about us? Do we make unnatural alliances to create a particular image that we want to put out, that we want people to think of us? Do we make unnatural alliances? Do we hang out with certain people or do certain things so others will think something that we're not? Secondly, we see that the Jewish leadership here in their hypocrisy used flattery. So hypocrisy makes unnatural alliances and uses flattery. It's, it's almost hard to read, isn't it? Knowing their heart, said, teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. Did they really think about that? Did they really believe that? <laughs> Absolutely not. For you do, are not swayed by appearances, but only teach the, teach the way of God. Oh, holy and exalted teacher, please have mercy on us. Please, no, that wasn't their attitude. They tried to sway Jesus with sugary words. They tried to bump Jesus off, off balance to, to catch him. That was their point. And so, as we can see in this text, the use of flattery is always self-centered. If someone comes up and tells you how wonderful you are, you need to be thinking in the back of your mind, what do they want? <laughs> what are they up to here? Because flattery is always self-centered. When you use flattery, you don't actually believe what you're saying. You're trying to gain an advantage. You're telling people what you know they want to hear about themselves. And then we see that hypocrisy also uses pretense. It 
makes unnatural alliances. It uses flattery. And here we also see it, it uses pretense. They acted like they had a sincere question. Pretense is the sinful use of words to produce an advantage for the one speaking. Did you hear that? Pretense is the sinful use of words to produce an advantage for the one speaking. It's when you say or do things with the motive to gain an advantage over the person you're dealing with or group you're dealing with. The religious leaders who were questioning Jesus had no interest in his answer other than to corner him and make him look bad to those who were listening, to upend him by his answer. Jesus knew this, of course. He knew they were trying to trap him with their question about whether or not they should pay the, the poll tax that was required by Caesar. He expertly, of course, navigated their lethal trap and in the process confronted each of them. So maybe even each of us. If Jesus were to answer that it's okay to pay tribute to Caesar, think about what he would be saying to these Jews. They would have lost complete respect for him. All Jews, rep all Jews that were there resented paying this Roman tax and believed it was wrong because of what it meant. It was a submission, really, to Roman rule and an acknowledging of Caesar's feigned divinity. That's what was on the table. This is exactly what we heard just recently Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood against. We're not going to do that, they said. Well, what about all the other Jews that were with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What were they doing? Bowing is what they were doing. So Jesus was not distracted by their flattery. He saw, he saw through their hypocrisy, their deviousness. He turned their question on its head and put the entire worlds of politics and religion on notice with his answer. It remains today one of the most profound answers to a question ever stated in the history of mankind. Let's see how Jesus exposes this hypocrisy in our text, which moves to the second question, the second point, divine exposure of hypocrisy. You know where this question and answer or this debate took place, right? It was in the temple. It was in the temple courts where this occasion happened. Um, when the day before, in this same location, Jesus had cleaned out money changers. Remember that? Now, we'd have to ask, especially after this dialogue here that we've just read, why were money changers in the temple? And what were they doing there? Well, because Roman money wasn't allowed in the temple, money changers were there to exchange Roman money with Jewish money, so it would be lawful for them to pay their taxes, to buy their animals for sacrifice, and so forth. Everything related to Passion Week required money, and they couldn't use Roman money in the temple, hence the money changers. But Roman money was corrupt in the eyes of most Jews, so you couldn't come into the temple grounds with Roman money, lawfully. Paying taxes to Caesar wasn't like you and I paying taxes to the IRS. That's not what was going on here. That's not the question. Jews, of course, paid taxes to their leaders, but this particular Roman tax wasn't about paying their fair share. It was about paying tribute or homage or worship to Caesar, and it was required. Rome required this, but Jews resented it. This question was not about paying taxes, it was about idolatry. That's what this was about. They were asking Jesus if idolatry was okay because the Roman government required it. Now, now the trap becomes more important, doesn't it, when you understand it that way? This was a significant moment in Jesus' ministry. Answer incorrectly, and he would lose all respect. And so here we see, as Jesus exposes their hypocrisy, that he calls a spade a spade. Notice in verse 15, 
it, Mark records, but knowing their hypocrisy, Jesus said to them. But if you turn back to Matthew's record of this, Jesus flat out calls them hypocrites. He goes, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? He calls a spade a spade. That's how Jesus exposes the hypocrisy. Jesus never was any good at beating around the bush, was he? No. He always went straight for the jugular. He knew he didn't have time to play patty cake. And by the way, neither do we with our friends and relationships. Eternity is in the balance. I think we need to cut to the chase more than we do, like Jesus always did, when we need to address things in each other's lives or when we need to get people that we're witnessing to the point of decision. And so what, what did Jesus do? He called a spade a spade. Sin is sin. Sin isn't, sin isn't a mistake. No, we rename sin, don't we, to make it more palatable. Not Jesus. You guys are hypocrites, is what he said. Next, the way that Jesus exposes hypocrisy is revealing the heart. Not just naming them for what they are, but revealing what's inside of them that makes them what they are. So when Jesus asked them for a denarius, he was laying his own trap for them. They thought they were trapping him. His response actually trapped them, which is part of the brilliance of his answer. He says, bring me a denarius. <laughs> the image would have been Caesar's, of course, on the denarius coin. The inscription would have been a statement that affirmed the divinity of Caesar, which I'll mention in a moment. But in order to possess a denarius, you had to go buy a denarius in order to use that coin to pay homage to Caesar, to buy the incense required to burn, to worship Caesar. So whoever gave Jesus the denarius, says they brought one to him, revealed where they stood as it related to the practice of Caesar worship. Right? <laughs> they had one. They shouldn't have, but they did. Jesus' request of a denarius, let me, let me help you see the profundity of the way Jesus handled this by illustrating it this way. Jesus' request of a denarius would be like someone asking a pastor about pornography. And the pastor responding would say, well, so, someone show me a, a Playboy magazine. You go, uh, uh, oh, That would be exactly like what's happening here. You, you have a denarius? We're in the temple. What are you doing? Right? Of course, it was probably one of the liberal Herodians who had it because it seems that people who view their relationship with God liberally use all sorts of th methods of justifying everything. And of course, I, I can see this happening, at least in my mind. The guy pulls the scenarios out of his pocket, you know, and, and halfway through it, he kind of, oh. And Jesus probably winked at him and then here, let me see it. <laughs> then Jesus asked the question, whose likeness and inscription is on this coin? Just so you know, the denarius was a silver coin with Caesar's image imprinted on one side with the words of Tiberius Caesar son of the divine Augustus. That was on the coin. On the opposite side, this was so rich, uh, was an image of Caesar's mom with the inscription, chief priest. On one side, the divine Caesar, the other side, and my mom is really important too. So the Jews considered the coins to be miniature idols and possessing them would have been a violation of the second commandment. Have no other gods before me. <laughs> and since this coin was a symbol of submission to Caesar as their owner and God, it violated the first commandment as well. Have no other gods before you. Have no false images before you. Have no other gods before you. Strike two. Now let's look at the divine remedy for hypocrisy that Jesus reveals here the divine remedy for hypocrisy. 
in case there anybody remotely possible that in this room struggles with hypocrisy. <clears throat> in Jesus' answer, he gives a good remedy for the hypocrisy struggle we each have. So do you want victory over hypocrisy? Then follow along as I try to unpack his answer for you. First, Jesus says, do what's right with human authority. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Do what is right with human authority. Caesar was a human authority established by God in their lives. So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. So let's start with the bigger concentric circle and work our way inward to the core issue. Starting with the bigger concentric circle. The word Mark used for render that we have in our copy of the Bible re refers to repaying something that is owed or, or paying back something that is owed. Let me read for you Peter's comment on the matter. Peter was there when Jesus explained this issue. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. That includes Caesar. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Obey the human authorities. In Romans 13, which we just heard briefly from this morning, Paul actually says that God has established human governments and their authority and they should be obeyed. This is what Jesus was saying in his short and penetrating answer. He affirmed the validity of the state as an institution established by God. Its divine validity has legitimate claims on our behavior in our day as well as in Jesus' day. The state has the authority to expect and enforce certain types of behavior. Render to Caesar's what is Caesar. If it's Caesar's, pay him back, is what Jesus was saying. John MacArthur wrote this concerning this response. The only time government may be legitimately disobeyed is when it commands something contrary to the law of God or forbids something commanded by it. Everything else is fair game for the government's requirement of you. But God has placed limits on that authority, hasn't he? On governmental, institutional authority. And there are at least two reasons to resist state authority. And I think this falls within Jesus' answer. And at least if we view it from Romans 13 and, and 1 Peter 1, uh, which I just read you. First reason that there is to resist the state authority when asked to violate a direct command of God. Acts 4 and 5, we see this truth. God told these guys to preach. They preached. The, the authorities didn't like it and told them not to preach. And what was their answer? Who are we going to obey, you or God? This is what we find in Acts 4 and 5. So we can't compromise our Christian ethics. We cannot act immorally. We have to obey God, no matter what the government says. Secondly, when asked to betray Christian conscience, God has given you a conscience that has been influenced by the Holy Spirit now that you're in Christ. And you cannot betray that, whether you're just a private citizen or working for a secular institution. That would require disobedience of any kind. So Christians are called to obey their government except what it means to disobey God. That's all included in Jesus' answer, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We shouldn't cheat on our taxes. We should obey traffic laws. We shouldn't participate in our, we should participate in our political process. That means we should vote. That means we should pray for our institutional leaders like we just did this morning. Um, so defeating hypocrisy in your life begins by honestly honoring what God has established with human authority. That's one way you begin. That's that larger concentric circle. You, you begin there by doing what you're told when it comes to human authority. Whether it's your parents or the president. But next we see here, do what's right with divine authority. Not just human authority. Resolving hypocrisy in your life includes 
doing what's right with divine authority. This is the more focused, smaller, centered circle of these concentric circles I'm addressing. When Jesus said, give to God what is God's, it trumped. It was over and above institutional human authority. God is the one who created human government. God is the one who places leadership where he does. But God is the one doing it. And so, of course, his authority trumps all others. And so Jesus gave leeway to Caesar in this earthly authority conversation. But he also gave supreme authority, trumping authority, to God over us. Render to God what is God's. Now, let me, let me help you see this from within this text, which is, I think, moving. Caesar's image may have been stamped on this little denarius, right? So that proved it was his. Whose image is stamped on you? Render to Caesar's what is Caesar's, this little silver coin. Render to God what is God's. God has stamped his image on you. He owns each of us. As Caesar owned each of these coins, God owns each of us. We are made in his image, it says in Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. It's a divine mint. You are minted in a divine way. And we bear God's image in many ways. This is a, a call for deep and abiding commitment to God. And so what or who do we pledge allegiance to? What or who do, do we worship? It's not wrong to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. That is not wrong. But our ultimate allegiance and pledge must be to Christ, our eternal king, who rules over an eternal kingdom. We are his people, first. Americans, second. So, when we, when we talk about doing what's right with divine authority, Obviously, the first stop is towards God, doing what's right towards God, right? Whose image on you? His image, God's image. We are made in God's image, so he alone should be worshipped, not Caesar, not anyone, not anything, but God. In Jesus' day, the coin legally belonged to the person whose image was stamped on the front of it. The coin itself actually answered the question they were asking, right? If it's his, give it to him. But if it's God's, give it to him. You see, God owns us on multiple levels. Even if you're an unbeliever, the minimum is that he created you. In addition, we, we would say that he has rights over you and they go beyond his creation because he sustains you through life. Whose oxygen are you breathing, by the way? Right? You say, well, I've, uh, at least I've earned my income. Well, according to the Bible, no, that's something God provided. It wasn't because you were so smart that you got the job you have, or you're so talented you have the job you have. No, it's because of God's graciousness to you. Who gave you your smarts? Who gave you your talents? And you can see where that conversation goes. God, of course, has provided everything we need to live happy and healthy lives. Even if you don't acknowledge him, he owns us. But if we do acknowledge him, if we are a believer, if we have embraced Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, there are many more ways in which he owns us. It says that we are bought with a price in 1 Corinthians 6.20. Not only... Did he create us, as Pastor Rick said? He recreated us in Christ. You were bought with a price. You were purchased with the blood of Christ to be God's possession. So glorify God in your body. For believers, 
We have been bought with a price and sealed with the Holy Spirit. God continually takes specific interest in our well-being, both physically and spiritually, if you're in Christ. He orchestrates the details of your life, both good and bad, produce godly character in you and glory to Him. And of course, all this comes together in a beautiful way in this thing we call joy. He brings joy to those who live in these parameters. Sometimes, of course, we miss that joy because we refuse to see the circumstances from God's perspective. But we must pay God what is due Him. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 basically says, this means all of you. Not all of you as a group, but every part of you individually. This is what is due God. Render to Caesar's what is Caesar. Give him some coin. But to God, you give him your life. You're a living sacrifice now. All of you, every part of you, your money, your family, every relationship, your vocation, your health, belong to God. Give back, render to God what he's given to you. Are you doing that? Or do you think all the blessings in your life are meant to be spent on yourself? Of course, <clears throat> thinking this way, doing what's right with divine authority, begins with God. That's, that's a no-brainer. But it, it, it flows into dealing with others. So giving back to God goes beyond just your relationship with God and is intricately connected to your relationship with others. Doing what's right towards God includes doing what's right towards others. There's no escaping this. In other words, the primary way we can love God is by loving each other. You can't just love God in some mystical way, at least in a practical sense. The Apostle John addresses this at length in his first epistle. The way that we love God is by loving each other. That's how you do it. The way you honor God is by honoring each other. That's how you do it. Listen to this, and by the way, this is just a, a, a taste of the depth of the Apostle John's insight on this subject. But listen to this, 1 John 4, 10 and 12. You ought to read all of 1 John to get a complete grasp of this. In this is love, he says, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a big deal. Beloved, if God so loved us with that intensity, with that amount of greatness, if God loved us like that, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us and love is perfected in us. You know how you can show God to your neighbors besides giving them a track? Loving them. <laughs> loving your children. Loving your spouse. Being thankful. Being warm and friendly. Render to Caesars the thing that are Caesars and to God the things that are God. That's Jesus' answer to hypocrisy. Start by being honest in your relationship with human authority and then being honest with your relationship with God that flows into your relationship with others. Let's pray. Father, we need this. We need these words from the pen of Mark inspired by your Holy Spirit. We need to see the, the great sacrifice that, that Jesus gave on our behalf in this story of the Passion Week, this last few days of Jesus' life. But we also need to deal with our struggle with sin, and particularly the sin of hypocrisy. And so we, we embrace this message from Mark chapter 12 
we acknowledge our struggle with our own hypocrisy and ask that you, Holy Spirit, would do your work in us. Help us to honestly submit to and embrace the human authority that, that God has placed over us. Help us to embrace and honestly embrace the divine authority that you have over us, especially how it leads to our relationship with each other. God, do this for us, we pray. We, we want to be a people that's glorifying to you, that brings joy to your heart, and we know that if we do that, we will have joy of our own. Bless us now as we go out and attempt to live this way for your glory, for our good. Amen.